Good morning, everyone. Glad to have you with us on this beautiful day. Beautiful summer day. It's summer now, right, Carl? It is. All right. <laughs> good, good to have you. Good to be here after three days on the road. So we praise the Lord for that. Let's do this. Let's go over to Hebrews chapter number two or cha chapter number 12 and verse number two is what we're going to look at here. All right. Hebrews chapter number 12 and verse number two. Okay. And I'd like to speak to you this morning about the mark of maturity. And the mark of maturity we're going to find is joy. All right. Is joy. So let's notice this. Hebrews chapter 2, or chapter 12, verse number 2. I'll get it right here. Where it says this, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now let's have a word of prayer, and we'll do our little study here. Father, we thank you for all you are to us. We thank you, you are a God of love. We thank you that you gave us your son who gave his life on behalf of us that we might indeed enjoy your fellowship. Now, Father, I pray you'd bless this uh, little study we're going to do this morning, and we'll thank you for that in Christ's name, and amen. So we're talking about joy here this morning, and we see in the verse here, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author. What, what kind of idea does that give you when you read about the author? Write stories. He's the initiator here of what's happening, okay? So Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. So there was a joy set before our Lord, and because it was set before him, what did he do? He endured the cross. Now, I, I, you know, just a little chart here, but uh, the cross work of the Lord Jesus Christ, he endured this because there was a goal, and the goal is joy, right? We see in the heart of God, there was always a cross. That's what the little heart is. So he endured this cross work for the joy that was set before him. And this is something we keep in mind. Now, by defining joy, we talk about delight, okay? Delight and gladness. Let's go back to Philippians for this, please. Philippians chapter number one, all right? Philippians chapter number one. And what we find in Philippians one, notice please verse number four. Paul here says, well, let's start in three. I thank my God. Now that's interesting. I thank my God, he says, Yahweh, right? In all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all. So you can see he's delighted. And, you know, as you read down through Philippians, and, and their attachment to Paul and attachment to the gospel and to the ministry, well, what's it do? It gives Paul joy, all right? So when he prays here and gives thanks to God in remembrance of these dear people, he's always offering prayer with what? With this joy. In other words, with delight, with gladness, he's doing this, see? With gladness. Then I slide down to verse 25, where it says, convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you you all for your progress and joy in the faith. So they themselves, the Philippians, say, not just had a progress in their faith, in other words, growing in faith, you see, but what else did they have there? They had the joy that came along with it, see? They had joy that came along with it. And I think we need to keep that in mind. So verse 4 says the prayer with joy. And then in verse 25, you see, their progress and joy in the faith. Now, you might have this, you know, hard to understand, but not all people are joyful in their faith. And why would that be, Brother Dan? 
because it hinders the flesh. Faith and flesh, spirit and flesh, are different from each other. And oftentimes, there's such a desire of, of the flesh, okay, it hinders what? The work of the spirit or your faith is, is actually what happens here. And so Paul is thankful for these folks because that's not the case with the Philippians. Man, they're progressing, okay, with joy in their faith. Let's praise the Lord for that. So joy is the one thing most evident in those who have been caught by the heavenly way and purpose of life. Um, come on over to Ephesians, please, chapter number one. Okay, Ephesians chapter number one. You get caught up to level two of life. <laughs> we, we might want to call it, all right? Level one is, is what you are in the flesh, the old man. But the new man now, okay, should be in level two where he's looking, as it says in Colossians, setting his affections on things where? Above and not things on his earth. So he's walking, we call it in the spirit, okay? Walking in the spirit. So when we look here at Ephesians 1 in verse number 9, it says this, he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him, who's in him, in Christ, okay, with a view to the administration suitable to the fullness of the times, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things on earth in him, okay? Also, he says, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose who works all things, his purpose who works all things after the counsel of his will. So when you read this, it's kind of interesting. What did Paul share with us? This mystery. And what is the mystery? It's heavens. Okay, and what's going on in the heavens? In the next hour, we're going to show you how the Lord Jesus Christ brought what's in the heavens back down to this earth. And God's and that's God's desire, all right? When you pray the Our Father, who, who knows that off the top of their head? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy will be done on earth as it is where? In heaven. Now, isn't that strange when they ask for a prayer? He connected heaven with earth. And I'm going to show you the connection here in the next hour. But as you look at this, so when you look at verses 9 and 11, then, let me read them one more time. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him. Kind intention. What, what, what comes to mind when you think of kind there? Okay. My, my, <laughs> what's that, Rose? Loving, caring, right? Okay, um, now in the New American Standard, in, in the uh, uh, column over here, it has good pleasure, say, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in him. So it's God's desire, okay, to do this for his saints. And then verse 11, also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of of his will. And so we praise God for what he has done for us. And as the Philippians, what should it do? It should give us a purpose to continue on in our faith. How? In joy. Okay? In joy. That's what it's all about. So believers today experience joy in three tenses, and that's what we're going to basically look at here. Past, present, and future. Now those who are mature, okay? Those who are mature and walk in the way of the cross will exhibit joy in their total Christian experience. You say, well, Brother Dan, that sounds almost impossible, especially with the world we live in today and everything is going on. See? Well, listen, we should be what? Above all this stuff, shouldn't we? I mean, it's there. What do we do with it? You know, last week when I was at a family reunion with my sisters and my brother Tim, uh, sitting speaking with my sisters, 
and, and something came up about the LGB crowd and, and, and all that and about homosexuality. And uh, I said, you know, folks, girls, I said this, I said, you know, I don't have a problem with any of that. I said, the only problem is because it's their mind. It's where they want to be, see. My only problem with all this is they want to push it on us. And then my, one of my sisters says, well, you know, Danny, I, I believe that homosexuality, they're born that way. And I didn't say anything after that, but talking to my brother Tim on the phone this week, he says, Dan, if they're born that way, then God's going to have to give an apology to Sodom and Gomorrah. If they were born that way, God's going to have to give an apology to Sodom and Gomorrah. What was the problem in Sodom and Gomorrah? See? And, and as you see that. So as we continue now to place our hearts and minds toward God and toward faith in what he has declared and not what we think is right, okay? It should be with what? Joy. What, what were the commandments that, that our Lord Jesus Christ gave and Paul repeats in James and Peter? All right, love whom? God, and love who else? I love mankind. Never does it say in the scriptures, love because you think you're right, or rejoice because you think you're right and somebody else is wrong. I was, <laughs> Susan's laughing. I was thinking of this, and I've thought of this for a long time, and as I read through the scripture, I keep looking for a place in scripture where God's going to judge your doctrine. Rose just, what? I keep looking for a place. Where is he going to judge your doctrine in scripture? No. Our lives, yes, as believers, and uh, of course, all the judgments here on earth, we do something wrong or we're, we're walking in the wrong way, God's going to do what? He's going to correct it right here. He's going to correct it through other people, through circumstances of life and all that. Because when, when we meet him, everything's perfect. We're forgiven, aren't we? We've been brought into the family. See? And listen, that's the same for a lost person, too. All sin has been taken care of and a punishment for it on this earth, all right, as we look at it. So when you look at the chart then, okay, we're looking to whom? Jesus. That's who we're looking to because he's the author and perfecter of our what? Faith. And he knows that. See, so what did he do? He endured that cross because there was something set before him. It doesn't say a lot of rewards and that sort of thing. It says for the joy that was set before him, joy, the delight, see, of being with his father, of understanding what's going to happen because of his cross work, what's going to happen with mankind. We're going to be brought into a relationship with him. That's the joy that, that was laid before our Lord Jesus Christ. He agreed to do that because of the joy that set before him. So our duty then is what, according to Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number two? Look to him. Looking to Jesus. See, that's what it's all about. And that's what we have to get in our hearts and minds. Looking unto Jesus. Now that word looking, let's see if I can say it in the Greek. Aphor, aphoreo, okay, means this, looking away from all else, looking at that which fills the heart. Where does perfect love come from? It comes from God, from our Lord Jesus Christ, see? And so we're to look at that, that's Colossians, I have written down here, Colossians 3, 1, 1 to 3, as you look at this. So we run the race, not because of the prize at the end, and not because of others before us who have done so, but because of the vision of Jesus thrills the soul. That's what it should be. I mean, after all, we are conformed to be, I mean, we are predestined to be conformed to what? To his image. So that should be thrilling. And God's plan for me, for Dan, kid born in Erie, Pennsylvania, father a paper maker all his life 
oldest of nine children, see? We didn't have everything in the world that people have today, but you know what we did have? Love, see? Love, and that's what it's all about here, see? The vision of Jesus should thrill our souls. So, Brother Daniel, say, what brings joy? Well, let's look at this. Come over, if you would, with me to Philippians chapter number one. What actually brings joy? Well, joy in remembrance of the cross. Okay? Remembrance of the cross. The world doesn't especially like that, but what are you going to do? Number one is this, as we look at the, as we look at the, and remember the cross. Uh, we all have a past. But it's truly past. You know, a verse pops into mind every now and then when I get condemning of myself. And that's Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is now no condemnation to whom? Those who are in Christ Jesus. None at all on his part. Now, other folks will try to do that with you. Okay? You, yeah, all the time. People that disagree with your doctrine, say, or other things, they'll, they'll do those things. All right? But in God's eyes, there's no condemnation. Not at all. We need to keep that in mind. Number two, the bondage of sin is no longer my master. It used to be. Come back to Romans with me, please, in chapter 6. Okay, Romans chapter 6. We'll keep going back to these verses here in the last month or two. But the bondage of sin is no longer my master. Notice verses 6, 7, and 8. Knowing this. Now, Paul writes this, but did these folks know this already? Yeah, they did. They knew this. Whoever took the message to them came from Paul. Paul had taught this. So knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him. Okay? You might say knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to whom? Sin. Now, to me, that's exciting because when you go over to Galatians, Galatians says there's no more Jew or Gentile, bond or slave. See? No more bond or slave. No more male or female in Christ, right? So when, when you read this, realize where you are, okay? You are in Christ, no longer slaves to sin. For he who has died is free from what? Sin. Now, who died? Who's we? Who's, make it more personal. My old man. That's sin nature within me, if you want to call it that. The old man, that's who died. Okay? Now, verse number eight, if we have died with Christ, so Paul's very definite. If we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also do what? Live with him. So the old man dies. You become a new creation, Galatians chapter 5, 17, right? And that's how you're walking. And when you walk with that way, then you're walking with whom? And living with whom? With Christ. Okay? Is that simple enough to see that? So then, that means in this chapter, according to verse 13, that I have a new master. And do not go on presenting the members of yourselves to God as those alive. I'm sorry, let me read again, all right? And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead. Now that's an interesting statement. What do we call that if you're alive from the dead? It's a resurrection. 
See, most, most, most Christianity is waiting for their body to be raised so they can say, oh, I'm resurrected. I've already been resurrected. See? That's right. So what we find is, you know, when you go to Ephesians, Colossians especially, you're going to find this principle. All right? As those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. All right? So we no longer serve the old nature, the old man, but rather as those that have been raised alive from the dead, and we, we serve and give our members over as instruments of righteousness to God. Now, to me, that's kind of interesting, okay? Really kind of interesting as, as you look at this, all right? As you look at this. Now, let me see where I am here, all right? Make sure I don't get ahead of myself in that sort of thing. So as we look at this then, all right, <laughs> what brings joy? Let's come back to Philippians, please, in chapter number one. All right. Yeah, I got it. I got ahead of myself just a little bit. So let me let me share this with you, okay? Philippians chapter one. And verse number four, and we read this, it was part of our text, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all, right? So why can Paul pray that way? Because these believers, all right, these believers took on the responsibility of what they were to be in Christ. That's what it's all about here. And that's why he was joyful in his prayers for them. Then we come back down again to verse 25. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you for all your progress and joy in the faith. So their growth, right? Verse uh, 26. So that you, so that your proud confidence in me may abound in Christ Jesus through my presence with you again. Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of what? The gospel. Okay? The gospel. Therefore, when you slide down to verse number 2 of chapter 2, it says, making my joy complete by being of the same mind. You notice that? We just, he just talked about with one mind in verse 27. And then down in verse chapter 2, verse 2, making my joy complete by being of the same mind. Now, where does Paul's joy come from? This is something we need to understand. It comes from these saints. By them being what? Okay? Faithful and being of one mind and that sort of thing that you see. In other words, they're like-minded, and Paul is thrilled to death, and he's joyful uh, because of that. Then I notice verse 17 and 18 in chapter 2, all right? 17 and 18. But even if I am being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I rejoice and share my joy with you all. Sharing his joy through the sufferings he's going through, on their behalf. You too, I urge you, rejoice in the same way and share your joy with whom? Me. So there's a sharing of joy going on here, even though Paul is what? He's suffering on their behalf. Okay. That sort of thing. And he, he's asking him, you do the same thing. So this joy can be shared together. All right. And that, that's what we need to see there. So when I come to chapter 4 of Philippians, come on over there in verse number 1, okay? It says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy and crown. Now he makes it very personal. You folks, he says, you Philippian believers are my joy and you're my crown. So he's looking at them as part of himself. My joy, my crown. You see that? He's excited, excited about that. In this way, stand firm in the Lord, 
my beloved, he calls them beloved. That's the same word that my beloved son that the father uses of Jesus, see, that Paul uses of, of these dear folks. So let's go on. This is where I jumped the gun a little bit to the three tenses. Now, in the past, I already talked about some of this, so we don't have to repeat this, but joy in remembrance of what? The cross, right? And why is that? Because we all had a past, but it's past. It's buried and gone, you see. And the bondage of sin is no longer my master. We read in Romans chapter 6, verses 6, 7, and 8. And so we have a new master now in verse 13. So here, here's what happens here. Come back with me to Ephesians 1. You and I have something that the world will never understand. All right? Never understand. Verse 17 says this. I'm sorry, verse 7 says this. In him we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of what? Okay. The riches of his grace bring forth to us redemption through the blood of Christ and the forgiveness of our what? Trespass. Now, what's a trespass? Does anybody know? Oh, we say sin. It's something that's done on purpose. Okay. And it's been forgiven. Now, now think about that. It's been forgiven. It's forgiven by God. Our problem is that men don't forgive. <laughs> Especially if you listen to the news today, read the papers and all that sort of thing. Men just can't find that in their, their own hearts. All right? Can't find it at all. It, it's really sad. So that brings me over to Colossians chapter 1, which repeats the same thing, actually. Uh, notice the 13 and 14 with me. It says, for he rescued us, chapter 1 of Colossians, verse 13, for he rescued us from the domain of darkness. And we read about that in Romans chapter number six, all right? And transferred us into the what? So is Christianity waiting for kingdom today? It shouldn't be. The kingdom's already here. We've been transferred what? Into it, all right? Already here in whom, the beloved Son, we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Now, Paul writes to the Ephesians and says, hey, your trespasses. Here he just gives a broad thing. Forgiveness of sins that comes because we have redemption that comes from the beloved Son of God. Okay? And we're in what? Right now, we're in his kingdom. We'll talk about that again in the next in the next hour, okay? So you and I then, you know, when I meet a, a believer that can't rejoice in everything, or anything, I should say, it just brings thoughts to my mind that shouldn't be there. Like, do you really know the scriptures at all? Do you realize what happened because of your relationship with Christ? that you have the forgiveness of sins, see? That you've been brought to that place, that you've been transferred into his kingdom. But yet what happens? Yesterday was a sad day. Really sad. Say, why is that, Brother Dan? Because the Yankees got no hit by the Houston Astros. And as a baseball fan, <laughs> What could be worse than that? Well, it's only one game out of 162, so not too bad if it's there, you know. But you don't want to forgive them <laughs> as, as a fan. And I, I'm being lighthearted here, okay? But it happens at best. It's been 20 years since that happened to them. So you say a bad day. Well, come back again to Ephesians 2, all right? I have you flip-flopping here like we do. Notice what it says in verse number 18 of Ephesians 2, okay? For through him, we both have our access in one spirit to whom? To the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, 
but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's what? I'm in the household of God, the household of the saints of God. Why? Because I've been transferred into the kingdom of his dear son. What's better news than that? Can you think of any? I mean, honestly, you know, th think about that as, as, as you go through the day, as you go through the week. You know, I, I end every message with, have a great week in the realm of whom? Jesus. His realm, not your realm. Your realm should be the same as his. But because we walk on the face of this earth, and these things go around, around us, we, came, we, we tend to get caught up in the realm of the world around us instead of his realm, all right? His realm. So when we talk about the present then, so that was the past. Now the present, we see there's joy. And this is why a lot of Christians can't live in joy because they don't participate in it. Participation in joy. Happiness comes from happenings. Joy does not come from happenings. Okay. True joy has its source in God and flows through those who have learned the abiding union with God. Our union with God is what brings the joy because we're participating with him and in his work and in his kingdom. Okay. And that's where the joy comes from. Again, come back to Philippians. All right. Or over to Philippians, I should say. And notice what it says here. Verse number two of chapter number two says, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose, God's purpose, not your own. Okay. Verses three and four, do nothing from selfish or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, there's the word mind again. Regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of what? Others. I heard a little uh, coming home from Pennsylvania yesterday afternoon. Once I got within X amount of miles, I, I, I put on, I'll tell you this, 95.5 uh, FM, that's the Yankee game. Okay, so I get here the beginning of it. And that's what I heard. So this morning when I got in the car, it was still on that station. All right. Does anybody know who Brother Weeze is? Okay, you know who Brother Weeze is. Okay, and, and, and his crew. Well, I think what they do is they replay these from during the week. But Brother Weeze gave a, a, a testimony, sort of, which was, it, it was good. He went to the pharmacy on Friday or Thursday, whichever day it was. And he pulled up to the parking place and all of a sudden, here's a guy running over, knocking on his window. And he thought, man, I'm in trouble. This guy's gonna shoot me, take my car, take my wallet, that kind of thing. So he, he put the window down a little bit so the fellow could talk to him. And the fellow says, buddy, I, I really need help. I need to get a prescription in here and I, I need some money for it. And he noticed that he already had two bags from the Walgreens, see? So he says, well, what's in, what's in the bags? He says, other prescriptions. But I didn't have money for the last prescription. So Brother Wee says, well, I'm going to roll my window down, and I want you to hand me the bags, because I want to look and see what's inside of those. He's thinking it's something that drug-related, you know, guy get high. So the guy does that and hands him the Brother Wee's. Okay, and Brother Louise looks at it, and there was. There's prescriptions in both bags. They were small bags, all right? So the guy says, yeah, I, I can really use some money. He says, well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I, I came here to get some prescriptions. Let's go in together, and I'll pay for your prescription. And it happened to be insulin, okay? So he goes up with the pharmacist, or to the pharmacist with, with the guy, and the pharmacist says, I, I can't do this unless you're related to him. And he says, well, I'm his cousin, and I want to pay for it. 
And the pharmacist asked the guy he was with, is he your cousin? Oh yeah, yeah, he's my cousin. So they buy, he buys the insulin for him, okay? Because the guy needs the insulin. And then when Brother Weeze went to order his, or you know, pick, pick his up, the guy was gone like a shot. Didn't say thank you or anything, okay? Now, Brother Weeze, well, what are you gonna do? That's, that's people, is it not? That's how they are. But what did he do? He became a detective, okay? So he could help somebody out. And you know what I find? That's what we need to do. We need to help people out that way, see? Instead of being totally afraid all the time. Now you ladies don't do that, but us guys can do that, okay? I mean, it, it's a sad situation. So what do we see here in, in this verse, okay? As, as, as you look at it, okay? With humility of mind, regard one another as more important than what? Yourself. And do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of who? Now, here's Brother Weeze. I have no idea if he's a believer in Jesus Christ or not, because I don't listen to the radio show. But what did he take? He took an interest in somebody else. To me, that was a great testimony. Although the, the girl and the other fellow, John DiTulio, that were with him were, you know, they, they were kidding him about it, that, that kind of stuff. But that's the principle that, that you see here. So in presence, right? Come back to Acts 13, please. All right. And keep your hand. I'm coming back to Philippians here in just a moment. Come on back to Acts 13. Let's see what time we have. Okay. Acts 13. All right. And let's pick this up, please, in verses 46 to 52. 46 to 52. Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and said, it was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first. Since you repudiate it and judge yourself unworthy of eternal life, behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us. I have placed you as a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the end of the earth. When the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as had been anointed to Eonian or eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was being spread throughout the whole region. Now, why was that? Well, the message was going to the Jews there first, but they rejected it. So he said, hey, wait a minute. Somebody's believing it. And who was it? It was the Gentiles were believing it. All right. So it, it, it actually, it's a beautiful thing when you see that right? You never know who's listening when you share the gospel. So when I come back to Philippians chapter one, please come on right back there with me. Got to hurry along now. Notice verse three to six, where it says this, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. So from the time that they received Christ, got their eternal life, what were they? Participation or participants in the gospel. For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you were perfected until the day of whom? Christ Jesus, okay? Until the day of Christ Jesus. These folks entered into a union with God, and to them it was precious. And they became what God wanted them to become, okay? Participants with him in the gospel here of Jesus Christ, okay? The gospel of Jesus Christ. Come on one more time back to Romans in chapter 5, if you would. Romans chapter number 5. Notice with me, please, verse number 11. And not only this, but we also exalt in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the conciliation, or your Bible says reconciliation, right? As you see that? Now slide right back down to verse 17. For if by the transgression of the one, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of the grace and the gift of righteousness will do what? 
reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. And in whose kingdom are you reigning? According to Colossians. The Son, the beloved Son's kingdom. It's already here. We already walk in it. Don't look for anything physical, is what I'm trying to tell you here. Looking to whom? Jesus. Who is Jesus? He's the temple of God. Who are you? The temple of God. So why is Christianity, some of it, looking for a new building? Call a temple. No, God's already here. He's in us, just as he's in Christ. Okay? As, as we see this. So through Christ, we reign in life. Therefore, in Christ, we, we have joy. Not outside of him, but in him. All right? We have time for one more thing. The future. Joy and anticipation. Hebrews 12, 2. Right? Looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, it was for joy that he did what he did. What happened to him? I don't have time to do this this morning, but write down Isaiah 53. Why don't you write, go read Isaiah 53. It happened to him, but it happened through him. The suffering Savior. Joy was set before him. Okay? Way before him. I'm going to turn a couple more passages, two more passages. First John and uh, chapter one, please. Then I'm going to close. Go read Isaiah 53. And chapter one, and let's notice the first four verses. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at, and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. That's Jesus, right? And the life was manifested, and we have seen and testified and proclaimed to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. So this eternal life, the life of Jesus, the word, was with the Father, right? With the Father, it was proclaimed to us and manifested to us that we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. How many times during the course of the day do you perceive that you're actually fellowshipping with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ? That's something that ought to continually come to us and through us. There are times when I'm on the road and listen to the radio, I just have to shut it off and say, man, this is, you know, it's good stuff and I like it. It's the old time radio. But wait a minute, what about the Father? My fellowship with him and my thoughts with him. See, as, as you look at that. Verse four says this. These things we write. Why is, why is John writing these things? So that our joy may be made complete so that the other saints might know our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son and all that they've done for us. I've written these so that your joy may be made, what? Complete. One last passage, and I'll close here for the Sunday school. Come to Philippians, please. Okay? Philippians chapter number one. And notice with me verse number 21, we'll go down through 27. Philippians 1, 21. For to me, to live is Christ. Now we've seen that passage about four times already. We reign, right, in his kingdom, etc., etc. So to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which I choose, which to choose. But I am hard pressed from both directions, 
having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better. Yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, which we've read twice already. So he's giving up his presence with Christ for their sake, see? So that you, that your proud confidence in me may abound in Christ Jesus through my coming or presence to you again. Only conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of what? The faith of the gospel is what we're to strive over. Okay? Because that's what brings the joy when we participate with God himself in the giving of the gospel. So I'll close there. Okay, close there. Joy is what we're looking at here this, this morning. Keep that in mind. So what are we to do? Look to Jesus, the author, finisher of our faith. That's who we're to look at. God bless you. Thanks for listening.